Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Ali Kubik, and I'm a facial pain patient and an FPA board director. We know that this is a difficult time for many of you, but we want you to know that the FPA is here for you. You can reach the FPA staff at info at tna-support.org. The Facial Pain Association will be continuing to have webinars, Facebook Lives, and virtual support programs during the current coronavirus pandemic. If you have not done so already, please visit our website at www.facepain.org where you can watch past webinars and access our library of quarterly journals. We have two upcoming events, which are both Facebook Lives. The first one is on Wednesday, April 22nd at 7 p.m. on the topic of diagnosis. The second event is also a Facebook Live on the topic of medical marijuana. This event will be on Tuesday, May 5th at 7 p.m. If you are not on Facebook, you will be able to view the recording on the FPA website and on our YouTube channel. Tonight's webinar, we are very lucky we have three doctors with us. During tonight's webinar, Dr. Jeffrey Brown, Dr. Steinbacher, and Dr. Portaheri will have a discussion on migraines, TMJ, and dental pain. A little bit about our doctors. Dr. Jeffrey Brown is on the faculty at NYU Winthrop University Hospital in Long Island. Dr. Brown is also chair of the Facial Pain Organization's Medical Advisory Board. Dr. Steinbacher is Director of Cleft and Craniofacial Surgery at Yale University School of Medicine, Associate Professor of Plastic Surgery and Chief of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. He is a double board certified plastic and reconstructive oral maxillofacial surgery and a fellow at the American College of Surgeries. He specializes in facial aesthetic, cleft, craniofacial, and maxillofacial surgery. His clinical interests also include rhinoplasty, orthopedic surgery, cosmic surgery of the face and body, and facial reconstruction. Dr. Steinbacher obtained his MD from Harvard University, Harvard Medical School, and his DMD from the University of Pennsylvania, both with honors. He received his fellowship training in craniofacial surgery from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia completed the plastic and reconstructive surgery program at John Hopkins Hospital and trained in maxillofacial and general surgery at Massachusetts General Hospital. He is a member of the Rhinoplasty Society, Aesthetic Society of Facial Surgeons. And Dr. Naveed Portaheri is joining us from Yale University where he's a craniofacial fellow. He will be an assistant professor at Indiana University Hospital in Indianapolis starting in August. He has his PhD in addition to his MD from Duke University. <clears throat> Excuse me, and he has rigorously studied and been involved in migraine surgery research for seven years. During the webinar, you may submit questions. We'll get to them at the end. And thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Brown. Good evening, all. I'm suspicious that most of you are becoming more and more adept at this virtual reality education as we all live in a different world from one, two months ago. Dr. Steinbecker is going to lead off and we're going to talk about this thing called the TMJ. So my first question is real basic to Dr. Steinbecker. What is the TMJ? Great. Well, thanks uh, so much for having me and, um, you know, looking forward to some good dialogue this evening. Um, and just by way of background, I think that's a great question. People say TMJ, I have TMJ or I have TMD, um, but everybody has a TMJ. You have two of them, two temporal mandibular joints is what they're called. Um, and these are basically the joints that um, go between your lower jaw and your skull. So these are what allow you to open and close your lower jaw, um, helping you eat and speak. Uh, move your jaw from side to side, yawn, uh, any type of function that's involving opening and closing of your jaw. So um, <clears throat> that's what the TMJ is. And just having a TMJ or saying TMJ doesn't mean there's something wrong with it. Everybody has TMJs um, and that's normal. 
So the TMJ opens and closes when we open and close our mouth. That's it. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of a complicated joint. It's not a simple ball and socket like your hip joint. Um, it's interesting. It's one of a kind in that for the first few millimeters that you're opening, about 12 millimeters, you know, a centimeter, a little more than a centimeter, it does open in a hinge type fashion where it rotates and it stays within. Uh, can you see my cursor here mm -hmm. on this slide that's showing? Yes. Yeah. So it, it stays within this little socket for the first centimeter or so as it opens. But as you open wider, uh, after 15 millimeters or so, this whole jaw joint slides down this way. This is in the front. This is the ear canal. This whole jaw joint slides out of that socket and then it comes back in. So it's, it's a complicated joint. Um, there's one on both sides, so they try to work in unison with one another too, but it's involved in what's called hinge opening for the first 10 millimeters or so, and then it, it has what's called translation, where it slides out of this, this fossa and then comes back. So when people open and close the jaw and they feel a clicking, is that normal or is that abnormal? So it can be normal. The clicking uh, comes about because this little uh, piece of material on top of the joint, which you can see here on this middle slide, on the both of the far slides on the left and the right, this is what's called the disc or the TMJ disc um, or meniscus, almost like a meniscus in the knee or any other joint but it's mobile and it's attached to some ligaments behind the joint. It's attached to some muscles in front of the joint. And in an ideal situation, this disc moves in unison with the what's called condylar head, the mandibular condyle, and it slides and gracefully opens um, and allows a cushion between the, the bone of the skull above and the mandible below. But in a lot of people, um, you know, the majority of the population actually has some type of click or pop when you're opening or moving your jaw at any point in time. It doesn't mean it's a problem or pathologic, but as many as 70, 80 percent of the population at some point in time have had a click because as this condyle is moving, it can create a noise against this disc and against the bone of the skull base in front of it here. This is called the eminence, the articular eminence. And these things, when they rub together, can cause a pop or a click. Um, but as long as it's still moving in unison or moving pretty well in a coordinated fashion, um, that click can be normal. But clicks can be abnormal too, which I'm sure we will get to. Well, if people have pain in their TMJ, what makes it painful? Why does it get painful? So um, the first you know, sort of differential is a lot of people have pain or think they have TMJ pain, but it may not actually be the joint. It's more frequently the muscles, the muscles around the joint. And I'm sure a lot of your webinars, you discuss back pain and trying to differentiate between a muscle problem and a problem with the spine and the discs. Uh, it's very similar here. And many people, because of uh, stress in their life or anxiety or things that they're doing at sleeping while they're sleeping that they're not even really aware of causes them to clench and grind their teeth or really tighten those muscles. It's a way that uh, psychologically um, or neuromuscularly uh, these muscles are tightening as sort of a manifestation of uh, other things going on in, in your life or um, while you're sleeping. So these muscles that are all attached to the joint can become really tight and tender. Um, and, you know, when patients come in and you ask them, where is the pain? They often notion you know, on the entire side of the head or the side of the jaw, not just a single location. And that is because the muscles can be tender. Um, so that's so the- What they use if they were describing the pain? What kinds of words would be the ones they would use? So, you know, anywhere from a soreness or a discomfort to, a, you know, a dull ache kind of pain. It, it's usually not a sharp shooting type of pain. It's usually not in a single point, um, but it's more diffuse. And it's something that they describe as, you know, existing on the entire side of, of the face, um, especially down along the jawline and up here between the ear and, and the eye on the, on the side of the skull. 
It's not really something up here like for headaches. It's not directly in the joint or in the ear, but it's usually a, a, along the, the side of the jaw. So that's important. Is it, is it, is it something that is described as a sharp shooting pain? Does it become that? Does it develop into that? Or does it stay as this aching pain? So usually if it's from the muscle, it stays as an, as an aching, a dull aching type of pain. Um, but that being said, sometimes you can have muscle problems and the joint is affected too. So because, um, you know, the joint can have disease or can have displacement of some of the, the structures there, then it can have a secondary effect or a, a downstream effect on the muscles themselves. So if somebody has just the muscle discomfort and you're palpating the muscles and it really causes them to have some tenderness, just like it might on your back after standing up, you know, for a long period of time during the day or doing yard work and getting muscle strain. If they have only that, you're pretty convinced it's the muscle. But if they have that plus they have a, a, sh a pain in front of the ear, usually sometimes even confused with ear pain, then we start getting concerned that maybe it's the joint uh, that's involved too. You want to talk? Um, I turned you loose to talk about the joint. Are we there yet? Yeah, so um, I mean, these are the two big differentials is looking at the the muscles and then looking at the joint intrinsically. And then, like I'm saying, once the joint intrinsically is affected, uh, the muscles can be secondarily affected too. Um, a lot of times when the joint's involved, it can lead to what we were saying in terms of a click or a pop but it could also lead to some functional disturbances where patients are noting that they're trying to open and they reach some type of obstruction or some um, difficulty in being able to open because there's what's called internal derangement where this disc is malpositioned or there's something that's preventing them from opening. Um, and there can be a couple different, people talk about lock jaw, um, which can be a muscle problem, but that is actually related to this disc typically. And there's something called a closed lock where this disc is in front of the joint here and it's preventing you from opening and closing your jaw. Or you can have an open lock where you've yawned or you've opened so far that this jaw joint gets stuck out here when you've yawned and you've done this translational movement, this condyle is moved in front of what's called the eminence and then you can't close. And these are the kinds of patients that present to the emergency room where, you know, they've yawned and they have a locked jaw open and they, they're unable to close. So people in the emergency room have to try to relocate this dislocated joint uh, or open lock type joint. Um, so when there's the TMJ itself is involved, usually there's some of these functional issues that goes along with it. Um, and I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about some of those, including arthritis and in, including disc displacement um, and so forth. This is just a slide that kind of recaps what we were just saying that in a lot of cases, it's just the muscles, you know, which are located in these locations. This is called the temporalis muscle, which helps close the lower jaw. This is called the masseter muscle, which helps close the lower jaw. So if patients have this pain all along here from basically the cheekbone down to the, the angle of the jaw, or the lower part of the jaw, and or they have pain up here in the temples, it's most likely related to the bone. If you have this TMJ, what's that? When you examine, it's just, it's tender. When you palpate it, when you push on it, the joint hurts, is that? That's the way, what's the finding? Yeah, so we want to first palpate this entire muscle, um, this location of the muscle. Uh, and if that is tender, um, then that is suggestive of a myofascial pain type disorder or uh, tightening. Um, and usually the patients will find that. Pardon me? What, what do you do to help someone if they have tenderness in that area? Yeah. So, you know, usually we try to understand what sort of behavioral or stressors have been in, in their life. Um, you know, is it their time of exams? Is there family stress or are there things related to their jobs that are relating to that? And 
seeing if there are behavioral managements that'll help address those things. Um, there's also behavioral management such as what have they been eating or chewing or doing? Do they chew a lot of gum? Are they, are they clenching their teeth? And we usually have them uh, try a soft diet for a period of time, uh, at least a few weeks so you're not chewing hard, uh, chewy foods. We have them try non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, just like for any muscle ache and pain, it can calm down the inflammation in the muscles. Um, we also try uh, Flexeril or other muscle relaxants uh, that can really help calm this down. Sometimes things like massage or physical therapy, uh, sometimes Botox, which we can talk about, which is uh, lasts for six or nine months. Um, there are also dental splints. Uh, when you think of the whole system, it's basically like a three-legged table. One leg is the occlusion or how the bite comes together, and then the other two legs are both of the joints. So if you can offload both of the joints by placing something in the teeth, that can sometimes help too. That's a little more controversial. Um, and there's varying- Does my um, uh, dentist make for patients that they wear that? at night? This is- Yeah, this exactly. Is they... Exactly, yeah, so it, it's- Let me know, are there fancy versions and inexpensive versions? Do they have, patients have to spend a lot of money to get fancy versions or is it all basically the same? Yeah, I mean, um, there, there's two reasons that you would use these. Um, one is because if you are grinding your teeth at night, you're definitely stressing and putting tension on the muscles, but you can also grind away some of your teeth. So placing them there to help protect the teeth is important. Uh, and that's a good reason to do it. And in such a case, I don't think it really needs to be customized or you can buy one at the drugstore that you can customize yourself. The thing that's a little more controversial is some people theorize that if you put some material between the teeth, it'll stretch the joints out of their location and maybe you'll be putting less pressure against them and that'll lead to uh, less pain and less TMJ problems. Um, however, that can cause some malocclusions in the teeth and it isn't really scientifically proven that that's going to affect the joint. And just because you have a dental splint in, you can still be clenching and grinding and, and affecting those teeth. So um, I think they're good options if you're really damaging the teeth, but I think you we really need to address the muscle first and foremost with a soft diet, with massage, with uh, muscle relaxants and Botox, uh, things like that. Okay, I've interrupted. You wanna move on to talk about what happens when the joint starts to deteriorate or what causes the joint to deteriorate? Yeah, so once we know that there is a joint problem, so here now we're looking at the joint. This is the condyle of the mandible. There's some opening muscles that are attached to that. These are both closing muscles that close the jaw. This is an opening muscle that when this, it's called the lateral pterygoid, it's attached to that condyle. It helps you actually uh, bring this out of the fossa. And then this is the disc here. Um, and this is just a recap what we've said, you know, usually these muscle problems are younger patients. Um, it can be any age, but a lot of times they tend to be younger. There can be some stress or other things happening in their life leading to this. They usually point at the entire side of their face and jaw. When we examine them, you can really feel tenderness uh, along these muscles. They usually don't have clicking or noise or things that they feel in front of their ear. We'll talk about radiology and some of the imaging that we obtain, uh, but we usually don't jump to getting any imaging if we don't hear any joint noise and there's no functional problem opening and closing. So they would have normal radiology if they come in with it. When the TMJ itself is affected, this can often be older patients, especially if we're talking about arthritis. They may have had a history of trauma. It may be something that they've forgotten or they were hit with a soccer ball or baseball or something like that. Uh, that is in, seems incidental, but can you know really lead to some damage here. They usually come in and point right in front of the ear. You know, they say my pain is here. It's not up here. It's not down here. It's literally in this one point. They often have clicking or joint noise. When they open and close their jaw, they may have this S-shape opening or some modified pattern of opening or difficulty opening because of uh, the obstruction or occlusion within the joints. And then they will definitely have some radiologic findings um, that we look at. So this scheme over here shows sort of a normal going from the far 
uh, right side of the screen over on the top panel, this is normal opening. So this disc slides along with the condyle, it comes out of the fossa over this eminence, stays here, and then when you go back, it comes back with it. When you start getting some disc displacement, this disc, for whatever reason, is in front of the condyle. So it, it's displaced or it's in front of it. Um, you can open, and this is called capture or recapture, uh, or with reduction, where the it ends up in the right location once you open, uh, and it you know when you open even further, it stays in the right location. But when you come back, um, the disc stays too far forward compared to the condyle in a closed position. So this is what causes the 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 pop. So in this case, you know there might be a pop here when this gets underneath the disc, and there might be another pop when you come back and you close your mouth. So it's because the disc and that condyle are popping against one another. When this becomes I, really, what's that? Do they do video opening and closing the jaw? Movies um, to see how this? Yeah, there are some um, arthrographic videos that can be done with radiologic dye and that type of thing. Most often we just get an MRI that's open and then closed. So you don't always see where the exact position of the pop or the click is but you can see where the disc is in a closed position and you can see where it is in an open position and you can assess you know, how it's moving or not based on that. Um, when it's really severe too, like this, the disc can start breaking down and can um, you know, be crunched up or have little holes in it and perforations and it can make more of a gravelly sound to it as opposed to a click or a pop. And this is a, a little bit more severe and things that we can see on an MRI where that disc just has a lot of signal and it can be abnormal. And these are the patients that can end up having bone on bone and just like any other type of arthritis, you know, can really do some damage there to the joints. So the, the diagnostic um, imaging traces an MRI of the TMJ? Yeah, so MRI is, is probably the best because you can see all the soft tissue, the muscles, and the bone pretty well. In some cases, we'll get a CT scan too because uh, some of the patients that I deal with, we're readjusting their jaws um, and or they have some growth disturbance. So we want to really look at the bone as well to give us an indication uh, of whether or not one condyle is bigger than the other, and that can lead to secondary TMJ problems. But if you were to get one study, then the MRI is probably the best. And when they're at this stage of deterioration, is are the symptoms still aching muscle tenderness pain, or does it change in any way in the quality of the pain? Yeah, so the that aching is more for those patients that have myofascial pain, where it's just um, the muscles or this early internal derangement, maybe they have some aching, but when the joint itself starts becoming impacted and you have this disc displacement, then they have they can have sharper pain, they can have pain that's aggravated after chewing, after functioning, speaking a lot, when they wake up in the morning because they're putting a lot of pressure, yes, on the muscles, but that pressure is uh, transmitting to the joint as well. So those patients, um, you know, can have more severe pain when the when the joint itself is involved. Is that is it possible to confuse the pain of joint deterioration in TMJ with trigeminal neuropathic pain? That's the key question. Yeah. And how do you differentiate? So I know that's th those are things that you deal more with, um, and those are more. Um, you know, maybe you can speak to the findings in trigeminal neuralgia a bit more, but those are usually within, uh, you know, the distribution of the trigeminal nerve in the, the lower division, the, the middle division or maxillary division or the ophthalmic division, and it's more in the central part of the face with some aggra aggravating factor that's not as much associated with the muscles or the joint. So, um, you know, usually um, the patients that we see are not uh, trigeminal neuralgia patients, and, and they're ones that have clear discomfort closer to their ear and not really in the distribution of the trigeminal nerve. That's the answer. This, if, it's a, if it's a sharp pain, it's right there in front of the ear. It's not in the ear, it's in front of the ear. Yeah. All right, go ahead and tell me what you do for it once you find it. 
Yeah, so this slide was what we talked about already, basically, you know, behavioral management, pharmacologic for the muscle issue. And maybe if there's a little bit of early internal derangement, a click or a pop that uh, is present in the joint. Um, this is that classification of internal derangement. So it's basically from a little bit of disc displacement to much more significant disc displacement where you can actually get arthritis and um, destruction of that disc. So just, just like with anything, um, you know, there's grades of it and ranges of it where it can start quite mild and it can get much more severe. So part of what we're treating when we're treating the joint is pain, but um, a lot of these patients with real TMJ problems have these limitations on opening, you know, where they either can't open or they're locked open and, you know, it's the clicking and popping is bothering them. So some of it is pain, and um, but a lot of patients are also concerned with the limitation of opening and, and difficulty with that. If it becomes so severe of an arthritis, which in a lot of patients that there's either some underlying rheumatic or um, anti-inflammatory type, uh, or sorry, some autoimmune or inflammatory arthritis or osteoarthritis type issue or trauma where the disc is moved out of position and the bone ends up fusing with bone. In those cases, some, you know, they may or may not have pain, but they can't open their mouth at all. And it's a really debilitating issue um, where they really just can't function. Um, I mean, we've seen patients with uh, ankylosing spondylitis that affects their temporomandibular joints and there's just complete bone on bone with no ability to open or close their mouth at all. I mean, you can imagine how difficult that can be in terms of eating um, or functioning. So, but let's take a step back and look more at the earlier stages of people that uh, are presenting with some internal derangement. We know the joint is affected and MRIs obtained showing this. Um, a lot of places they start with these little washouts and arthrocentesis it's called or an arthroscopy where you look with a camera just like you would with a knee arthroscopy. Uh, to me, it doesn't really make much sense because it's, um, you know, you're not really changing the dynamics uh, or the structure of the joint. You're washing out some of the synovial fluid, maybe. You're looking at it, maybe, but you know the amount that you can really um, change the joint is very limited. Um, not everybody agrees with me on this, um, but to my way of thinking, you know, I think this is um, you know, not gonna be that therapeutic. The things that are, are more involved, uh, you have to go into the joint and you have to repair some of these things. So you can repair and reposition the disc. A lot of times what I like to do is actually smooth away some of this bone so that uh, the disc can ride and position itself more freely with the, the uh, condyle as it opens and closes. Uh, and this is called an arthroplasty, uh, which is a little bit more aggressive than these first two. But let me talk about something in between that we've been doing and we've borrowed from some extent from the orthopedic literature. And that is when patients come initially and they're intermediate, mild or intermediate, um, we begin before jumping to an arth uh, arthroplasty, we do what's called fat grafting with stem cells. We basically liposuction fat. This is injected into areas of the joint. So the superior and inferior joint space around the disc into the muscles. It can help um, in terms of healing and regeneration of some of the tissue there. Um, we also use Botox at the same time around the muscles. Uh, in, you know, um, in a lot of patients, doing this once or twice uh, can be um, you know, very therapeutic and they'll never need another type of procedure. Tell me about this stem cell thing. Where do you get these stem cells from? So just from the uh, liposuction, you know, whenever you take fat, there's some percentage of stem cells, adipose derived stem cells in this lipo aspirate. Um, and we prepare this and we strain it in a way that, you know, we try to maintain as many of these stem cells as possible. It's not a 100% stem cell injection, obviously, but there's a, a pr proportion of stem cells within any cc of fat that we're injecting into the joint. Um, so it's very minimally invasive. It's literally a 20-minute procedure, which is similar to the arthrocentesis or arthroscopy, but instead of just washing it out, you know, we're actually introducing the patient's own cells uh, and tissue there that can help with regeneration and can help be anti-inflammatory. 
while they're there under this sedation, we uh, can give them some Botox, which will calm down the muscles too. Um, and this lasts usually for at least six months, nine months. And then the course from here is, you know, uh, one time they may be, um, you know, uh, symptom free and don't need anything else again, except for some of their behavioral modifications. In an intermediate case, they might need this repeated another time. Um, in a more severe case, you know, we do this once or twice. And if they're still not getting the symptoms and or they have significant arthritis or internal derangement, then we can move to an arthroplasty. Um, so this is this is the protocol that I like to use. You know, if it's either a mild situation, um, you know, we start with this fat grafting and Botox, a little bit of steroids, not into the joint, but more around the muscles and the attachments in the capsule. If we know that this is too far gone and the disc is too far forward and or this phase one was not successful after once or twice, or it, maybe it helped a little bit, but not enough, then we can always move to this arthroplasty. Uh, you know, the way I do it is sort of like a facelift, so you don't even see the incision there, but it really enables us to smooth some of the bone, make sure this disc is in the right position, uh, smooth any of the, um, you know, me mechanical or anatomic reasons that there's pain or functional limitations. Um, and this procedure too is a go home the same day type thing. It's about 45 minutes to an hour, hour and 15 minutes at most. Um, and they go home the same day and, you know, it can be uh, really significant uh, quality of life improvement um, as well. I see a number of patients, unfortunately, who had disc replacements. So what is the role for a disc replacement? Yeah, so there's, <clears throat> you know, all types of um, strategies that have been employed in the past. And I think people may still do those, but, um, you know, my approach is this in this schema here, this is showing the disc over top of the condyle, and this is the bone. And really where the, the disc gets beaten up is because it gets pushed against this lip of bone. So my approach instead of removing a disc and then you're stuck with bone on bone and you're definitely gonna get arthritis. If you do that, I'd prefer to remove this lip of bone so that there's no pressure being placed on the disc. Do some fat grafting to the disc or repair the disc if you can. Um, if there's too big of a hole, there's some, some better applications that have come out these days, including using amniotic membrane uh, that can be placed here. It's used for eyelid and other uh, areas too. It's great because it's anti-inflammatory. So fat is anti-inflammatory. This amniotic membrane is anti-inflammatory and it'll help regenerate the disc together with fat. So in my hands, you know, uh, uh, almost never would I want to remove that disc. Um, I'd rather open up the structure around there, repair the disc, bring new tissue to help regenerate it. I was hoping you would say that because some of the patients in the most severe pain have had their disc replaced with some kind of silicone implant or things, and they're in a lot of trouble, unfortunately. So yeah. thank you for saying that. Um, what I hear you saying is that you should not be confusing trigeminal nerve pain, trigeminal neuralgia, trigeminal neuropathic pain with the pain of TMJ. It's not the same. Right. Exactly. Those are two, two uh, very different things. And then a lot of times this muscle pain that I spoke of at the beginning is confused with TMJ. And, you know, nine, a lot of uh, instances, it's really just the muscles and some behavioral strategies will help uh, people uh, alleviate, mitigate those symptoms, keep them at bay, and they'll never need a surgery if that's the case. If the joint starts becoming involved, then yes, but there's these new exciting strategies, I think, that are out there that can really, um, you know, improve patients' function, mitigate their symptoms without all these old materials that people are using 10, 20, 30 years ago. I'll, I'll let you wrap up so we can move to the next discussion. 
Yeah, so I think that's about it. I mean, my last slide here was that in certainly in really significant cases of arthritis or trauma, you do need a, a total joint replacement similar to a knee or a hip or other joints. But these are reserved for really those people that I was speaking about that cannot open or close at all um, and have severe functional limitations and do not have a normal joint. The other thing that I see in a lot of cases, because I do jaw surgery for repositioning for clefts or for aesthetic or for dental facial problems, is the joint can be the foundation. So we want to make sure that that joint is stable and it's not either eroding away, like building a house on a sinking uh, foundation or growing too much on one side. We can see some asymmetries like this patient because of some growth disturbance that pushes things over. So these are some different cases that we have to deal with the TMJ2. Um, but, um, you know, I think that pretty much sums it up. These are uh, ways you can get a, in touch with me. Um, and I'm happy to answer any other questions. And I'll, I'll be still on the line, obviously, through the migraine talk. Thank you, Dr. Steinbecker. Um, this will be posted on the webinar, which is our website so they'll be able to see that. I have a question related to the surgery that I do for trigeminal neuralgia which is called balloon compression. It injures the um, innervation of the pterygoid muscle and for a period of time patients get pain in their temporal mandibular joint because of the malocclusion of the weakened pterygoid muscle. If they came in to see you with that symptom, how would you help them? It's temporary, perhaps a month, but what would you tell them to do? Yeah, so um, I mean, part of the issue probably is that it's on one side rather than the other. So it's a unilateral or it's an asymmetric issue. So if you have one muscle working more and the other not, then you, know, you could consider Botoxing on the opposite side or just doing splint therapy or muscle relaxants for a period of time while that kind of normalizes and abates. Um, but you're you're right. It's probably a muscle issue, and um, you know usually should go away. All right. Thank you. Stay around. I would like to turn to your left and speak to Dr. Pudahari, your fellow, well trained, I trust, who wants to talk about innovative treatment for migraines. So I got you set up. What? would you define as a migraine headache? So many of my patients come in and say, I got migraine headaches, but they have no idea what a migraine headache is. How would you define that? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I've, I've studied the topic for a long time and I'm just looking forward to providing as much good information as possible for patients that are tuning in. Um, I think that a lot of patients suffer from headaches uh, it is the seventh leading complaint of a patient coming into a doctor's office, and it's very important to clarify with them what their symptoms are because there is a big difference between traditional or cluster headaches and a migraine headache. Um, one of the key differences, uh, you know, both involving pain inside the head, a migraine headache uh, has very specific criteria put out by the International Headache Society and you can go to their website to see it, but basically these headaches last a long time, somewhere between four to 72 hours, and they have to have other qualities that distinguish them from a traditional headache, such as having a pulsatile quality, very severe pain intensity, or causing you to change your behaviors like not moving or avoiding physical activity because those activities can make the pain worse. It also needs to have other quote unquote central symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, photophobia, which is uh, lights bothering you or phonophobia where sounds uh, bother you. And it can't really be attributed to another problem such as trigeminal neuralgia or a nerve impingement due to uh, prior uh, trauma. Okay, so the neurologist is the one who defines it as a migraine in general, correct? Yeah, I mean, headache specialists in general, um, most of them are neurologists, but there are other types of uh, headache specialists that are not neurologists, such as uh, PMNR doctors and other types of pain specialists that have devoted their career to studying headaches and craniofacial pain. 
Um, but it is mostly a neurologist that I would recommend going to for the diagnosis and the medical treatment. So the diagnosis is made. The initial treatment consists of what in general? So initial treatment uh, consists of medications. There are varying types. Um, you know, something as basic as Excedrin is tried, uh, triptan medications that affect serotonergic or a type of um, uh, receptor pathway uh, associated with migraine headaches can also be tried. And there are more advanced medications that are targeted towards other receptor pathways uh, that can be antibody-based. There's a whole slew of medications that patients can try. They all have different side effects. And depending on how they're tolerated by the patient, they work with their headache specialists on coming up with a regimen that optimizes their symptoms, but also uh, they're not burdened by the, the side effects of those medications, which can be things like fatigue or um, trouble thinking or remembering things. So, so just in brief, um to help elucidate the mechanism of a migraine headache, why do they use these things called triptans? What do they do that makes a migraine go away? Uh, so, uh, you know, they, they are implicated in working on pathways that affect blood vessels and inflammation that's associated with the migraine headaches um, that goes beyond a traditional pain medication, which is a, uh, something like ibuprofen, which is a general uh, anti-inflammatory medication that works on general pathways for pain. These are more specific for the migraine-related pathways of pain. Um, and then obviously narcotic pain medications, which are the worst medications to use in these instances, which work specifically on uh, the pain centers within the brain itself and have nothing to do with the inflammatory component of this uh, very common illness. So what I'm getting at is a migraine has something to do with changes in the size of blood vessels, is that? It, yes, that is uh, one thing that has been attributed to um, this disease and it uh, seems to be very co closely related to the blood vessels in and around the brain and within the covering of the brain called the meninges. Okay, so these medications, there are a number of them and patients are treated for varying periods of time. So when do they start thinking that the medicines aren't going to work and start dialing your number? Yeah, so um, uh, just going to uh, skip forward. Um, uh, basically, six months of pain um, it, uh, that is not controlled by medications uh, can be associated with failure of medical management. Um, and that also includes um, not being able to tolerate the medications. You've tried several, at least two or three, and you're not getting a benefit or the side effects of the medications are too much for you to maintain that treatment. Um, generally about three to six months of this type of failure, then you can start asking your headache specialist about um, you know, whether or not they think surgery would benefit you. So three or six months, not 10 or 20 years, not 40 No, or there's no reason years. to suffer that long, no. These medications should work within three months. Uh, some, you know, uh, patients uh, notice benefit a lot sooner than that, obviously, but you want to give it some time, I'd say about six months uh, is a general rule of thumb, and then you can um, go from there. Okay, take it from there. Uh, well, I just wanted to briefly talk about how common these illnesses are and then go into how this field of migraine surgery started because there are a lot of myths about it. And again, I, my goal is to provide good information for people, both patients and headache specialists out there who have kind of learned thing, um, you know, one way and don't really know all of the information that's out there. But uh, a lot of people suffer from this really unpleasant illness. Uh, it can be debilitating, as you know, and it affects, uh, you know, over 35 million people in the United States. At least one in four households know someone or have someone in that household that is suffering from these migraines. Uh, it's generally affecting adults. 
uh, but there are some adolescents, about seven and a half percent of adolescents have this illness as well. It's more common in women for some reason. And uh, the treatment costs uh, and visit costs and the work days lost are on the order of tens of billions of dollars to the United States economy. And so it's something that I think definitely needs more attention than it is getting in terms of coming up with better treatments to help these patients. Um, and just to go into where migraine surgery started, this isn't something that's brand new uh, that you know someone uh, came up with yesterday. This is something that uh, was noticed over 20 years ago by a plastic surgeon in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and it has been followed with uh, dozens and dozens of very rigorous research articles on the subject. And these research articles are um, you know, including uh, randomized controlled trials, placebo controlled trials, sham surgery, where uh, an incision is made and either a surgery is actually performed or the incision is made and things are closed up. And uh, based on this research, it is very obvious that there is something here with migraine surgery uh, that can benefit these patients beyond what the medications uh, can offer. Uh, so just going back to uh, some of the theories on what causes a migraine headache, we talked about these blood vessels in the dura or the, or the um, covering of the brain. And you can see here in this image at the top um, that these uh, blood vessels are connected to uh, centers that are in the uh, deeper parts of the brain and the brain stem. And there are inputs that also come in from the face and the scalp here with these arrows. These are branches of the actual trigeminal nerve, which can also be involved with something you're very familiar with, which is trigeminal neuralgia. Um, and Basically, this input from the uh, outside of the brain, basically your face, scalp, and neck, uh, can cause sensitization or basically um, hyperactivity of the pain centers within the brain. And so uh, central factors, sorry, go ahead. How do you know this? How do, how do, that seems to be the essence of your, your um, approach to the surgery, but um, how do we know that a pain in the face can sensitize something that causes a migraine headache? Well, Is so the, there are a list of articles that I kind of include on some of these slides, one of which I would highly recommend reading this one. Uh, but essentially, we know that the uh, nerves themselves in the periphery of migraine headache patients are diseased. They are different fundamentally uh, than the nerves of uh, patients who do not have migraine headaches. You can see here, this is a normal patient's nerve on the outside of their head. Uh, this green staining shows myelin. It's sort of like the insulation of a wire. And here in this migraine patient, you can see a lot less myelin. It's loosely correlated with the actual nerve fibers. Uh, it's more linear in orientation. And I mean, just to a lay person seeing that this has a lot more insulation than this, you can tell that there's something wrong with this nerve here in this migraine patient that is very obvious to people uh, in the surgical specialties that look at these nerves uh, either under a microscope or under direct vision. Uh, we also know that these uh, the bony uh, tunnels in the head and neck, uh, here you can see this uh, CT scan in three dimensions, there's a small hole here that this branch of the trigeminal nerve comes out of in order to uh, take sensory feedback from the areas of the forehead and the brow. And these tunnels, these bony windows, again, in these migraine patients uh, tend to be smaller. And the smaller these bony tunnels are, the worse their symptoms are. Uh, so again, a, a, a correlation between what we are seeing in the peripheral anatomy outside of the brain that is fundamentally different in migraine headache patients. Uh, we can also look at the muscles and the arteries very similarly to see that you know a lot of these muscles are hypertrophied, overused, uh, they're tight, 
and they're pinching on the nerves in the periphery, even the arteries here, you can see not only can they wrap around the nerves and cause pain in that regard, but they can also produce inflammation and cause uh, sensitization of these pathways in a similar fashion. Are you able to hear me, Navid? Yes, sorry. What was your question? The question, is this a, a routine that migraine headache patients will have small tunnels for their nerves? The trigeminal uh, yes. nerves? So that particular study that I mentioned is looking uh, at patients who have undergone treatment for migraine headaches uh, with a surgeon and comparing uh, their findings on CT scans to patients who uh, are normal. So, so you think migraine headache is a, is a problem of the skull? Is a number of things contribute. Uh, number one being the nerves themselves are diseased. Uh, bones can be, in, not everyone has a bony tunnel. You can see here on this side of the image, this is what's called a superorbital notch. It's actually a lot, a lot bigger. Migraine patients can have these as well. And so in these cases, obviously the bone is not as involved. There can be fascial bands, but you have to look at all of these things as a whole because there's something that is pinching on the nerve. Uh, one quote uh, that we use in the plastic surgery societies to talk about this problem is that migraine headaches can sort of uh, be a, a carpal tunnel syndrome of the head and neck, which means uh, something is pinching the nerve that is causing the symptoms of pain, uh, uh, numb, tingling, uh, and things that are basically feeding back onto the brain exploding it into a migraine headache. Um, and this is why I, I kind of like to use this diagram to talk about how these peripheral factors play into these central factors. Hmm. Okay, we're gonna run out of time, I'm afraid. So I'm, I don't know how I can get you to the point of explaining what it is that you can do to help these people. No problem. Um, so, uh, a lot of what we do uh, is a, a clinical exam. We talk to the patient. The most important thing that patients need to know and that they can do uh, to help their doctor and their surgeon is to actually keep a migraine headache journal. Uh, that's uh, a daily account of where they're having headaches and where this pain is coming from. Uh, and this means you know, being able to think about where their headache started Generally, there's a soreness that patients can remember. You ask them to point with one finger and they say, right here, this is where most of my headaches start, or right here, this is where most of my headaches start. And this gives us an idea that there's something in the periphery uh, involving the nerves here or here that's causing their problem, and that is how we target surgery. One of the things that's different that I wanted to highlight is uh, pain that's coming uh, from behind the eyes. Uh, if a patient says that, it's pointing more to within the nose, which can be a little confusing, but a CAT scan can help look. Again, this is a migraine patient's CAT scan. Uh, you can see here, this is the middle of their nose, the septum, and it's deviated or bent off to one side, and it's touching one of these other structures in the nose called a turbinate. And so in this patient, uh, the goals of surgery would be to re remove this uh, area of compression uh, by straightening the septum and uh, cutting back this turbinate so that they're no longer touching and causing compression of the nerves inside the nose. Uh, inside ask, the, sorry, go ahead. Let me ask, what kind of pain, what, what symptoms would someone have if they have one of those pointy things in their nose? What would they, what would they feel? Yeah, so this is, uh, again, 70% of migraine headache patients uh, will have this type of uh, source of pain. Um, this is pain behind the eyes, generated to changes uh, of these turbinates inside the nose, which can swell uh, due to weather uh, changes or allergies or changes in hormone, uh, hormones with your hormonal cycle. Uh, and if, if patients are saying that, it's probably something inside the nose or this uh, particular type of 
source that um, we know is causing uh, a peripheral trigger. So no, let me let me ask it clearly. If someone has one of these um, trigger points in the nose, do they complain about an aching pain in their nose or a stabbing pain in their face? I see. Uh, the quality of the pain is more of an aching behind the eyes. That's important to know. We're gonna we're, we want to give people time to ask questions, or they're gonna be upset at me. So in uh, just a few minutes, can you explain what a plastic surgeon can do to help? Yes. Um, well, a plastic surgeon can, um, uh, through um, identifying which nerves are involved, perform what's called nerve decompression or trigger site deactivation. Similar to a carpal tunnel surgery where we decompress the nerves, we go in either through an upper eyelid incision for the nerves that are affecting the forehead, or we go in through small incisions. Uh, in the uh, auriculotemporal area, we can make small incisions in the scalp behind the hairline. Again, these are all very small incisions, very well hidden, uh, designed by a plastic surgeon in order to approach these nerves under direct vision or uh, indirectly with the scope to look at the nerves and remove anything that's in the way. We remove portions of the muscle that are pinching the nerve. We can remove parts of the bone. Uh, we can remove the arteries. All of those things that we talked about are removed to free up the nerve and give it relief. And um, in a broad and term, so, when you do this, can you get patients off medication? Yes. By doing so this? if th this study that was published just this last year is a systematic review uh, looking at uh, again, hundreds of patients, uh, prior studies, and it shows that, you know, in about 38% of patients um, who come in for migraine surgery, uh, they get complete elimination of their migraine headaches. This means that they don't have these migraine headaches anymore. Um, and, you know, that's a, that's a very big number, particularly considering that this allows them to come with their medications. Uh, but even for patients who don't uh, get limited of uh, take medications after surgery, still, uh, you know, 80% of patients have a significant benefit. That means at least 50% reduction in their symptoms. That's talking about the frequency of the headaches uh, coming on, the duration of how long these migraine attacks or these headaches uh, last and the intensity of that pain. A lot of these patients, again, 80 to 90% of them, um, have a much better quality of life after surgery than they did if they had just continued on the medications alone. And these are very basic procedures in terms of recovery for patients. They're technical in terms of uh, planning, uh, but you know, it's a same day surgery, somewhere between one to two hours. A lot of these can be done without even putting the patients to sleep and the risks are very mild. Okay, stop right there. I don't wanna cheat the people who have questions. Ali, thank you. It's, I pushed you to go really quickly. This is obviously a topic that needs more attention. Can you throw us some of the more Yep, so questions? I have a question for all three of you. Um, is it common for a patient to have a diagnosis of TMJ and facial pain and migraines, or would it be more likely that there is a misdiagnosis there? I'll take it first. I'm interested in this topic because I see a number of patients who do have trigeminal neuropathic pain who seem to have started their road with surgery on their temporal mandibular joint perhaps years before. So I don't necessarily mix them in with migraine, but if you listen to the webinar from one of our, our uh, previous uh, discussions from Dr. Hussein Asari, he believes that migraine is a common element of facial pain as well. I'll give it to the other two members. Yeah, I think um, these things can certainly overlap. I think there's some diagnostic criteria that usually point us in one direction versus the other, you know, with uh, 
loud noise and music and, and light and things like that for migraines and other headaches and sending them to a headache specialist versus some of the functional issues like I'm talking about in the position of pain and radiologic diagnosis to go along with it for, for TMJ. So I think, he, of course, as with any of these things, it's possible for them to all overlap. Um, but each has its own specific set of findings and symptoms. Next yeah, question. I agree. There's an association. Um, a lot of patients can actually have both. Uh, and it's important to know that some of these pathways can overlap. Something happening on the outside, such as the joint in the periphery, can sensitize pain centers inside the brain. And migraine patients can actually have both temporal mandibular uh, doint, joint disease and uh, actual migraine headaches. It is possible and, and uh, not uncommon. Ali, if you have a number of questions, I'm wondering if we should post some uh, answers uh, in written form if at the at the bottom of the webinar or something, because I don't see how we're going to get through them all in the in the next 30 yeah. seconds. But more. Um, if people have additional questions, if they could send an email, and would, doctors, would you guys be open to answering via email? I would. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Then yeah, thank yeah. you, everyone, for joining our webinar this evening. Uh, again, please mark your calendars for our next, um, our Facebook Live is actually next Wednesday. Uh, we will notify you when the webinar is available online for you to review again. Thank you so much and have a great evening, everyone. Thank, thank you, you very much for having me. Thank you very much.